Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Marketing Officer of Ping Identity and your host for this afternoon, Brian Bell. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, everyone's had a great morning. I see quite a few folks just uh, walking in. There's plenty of seats up towards the front and on this side as well. So uh, make yourselves comfortable before we get started. Um, hopefully, everyone's enjoying the content today. How's it been this morning? Good? Good. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker. Uh, it's an honor to have Microsoft uh, be a sponsor at the event and to continue to contribute to a lot of the content here at CIS. Um, Alex Simons is no stranger to CIS. He spoke at CIS last year um, and was very well received, and we're very excited to have him back again this year. Alex is, uh, creates and uh, drives the vision and evangelizes the roadmap for Microsoft uh, Azure AD and, and Windows Server AD at, at Microsoft. And we're very excited to have him back here today. He, uh, He's, uh, he's a ballsy guy, too, because he's going to be showing a live demo of unreleased product in this session. But, uh, but he's feeling confident because he told me last night a voodoo fortune teller told him he would have no problems during the session. So we, uh, we're very excited to have him here. So without further ado, let me welcome Alex. Alex? All right, thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Simons. Uh, I don't know about how the demos are going to go, but I'm feeling good because I kept lunch off my shirt. That was my whole objective for the last several hours. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, New Orleans is it's my favorite city in the whole United States. The best food, the best music. What a great place. And I get to come for my favorite conference, all the best people. Uh, what other conference can you go to and have a debate about whether blockchain or hash tree or whatever is the future of identity, right? Most conferences, I spend my time explaining why anybody even cares about identity. So it's really, really fun to be here. But this is only my second uh, talk at CIS, and I look at the agenda and I see who's talking. It's kind of intimidating, right? Like, it's like the who's who. Well, first of all, how'd they get General Petraeus to come? Uh, but it's also kind of like the who's who of identity. Uh, I'm not sure I deserve to be here. In fact, I kind of feel like the kid photobombing the stage uh, at, based on who all's here. Uh, but hey, I'm excited to be back. Last year, I spent a bunch of time talking about some trends in, the, in terms of identity and the cloud and then security and some ideas about how we as an industry could work together to really enable this new modern world of digital identity and giving enterprises and consumers the ability to take advantage of these amazing new capabilities. And I thought the thing to do this year would be to just kind of revisit that and talk about the progress year over year, what we're seeing, uh, the amazing kinds of collaboration that have happened in the industry, and, uh, and lay out some ideas maybe for next year. So the first thing I think we can definitively say this year is it really has been the year where enterprise cloud became a real thing, right? Like maybe 18 months ago, most enterprises were talking about, will I go to the cloud? Why should I? What's the value? It seems like that has really shifted dramatically. Every customer I meet with now is working on an implementation plan. They are deploying, they are using. It has really been a dramatic shift. Uh, and, uh, you know, a bunch of numbers to kind of emphasize that, but I think we can really say that this was the year that we kind of crossed the chasm in terms of businesses using the cloud as a, as, as a part of their uh, IT infrastructure. Uh, similarly, what we're seeing in the identity space mirrors this. We've seen, of course, continued growth of our consumer uh, identity services. So Microsoft account now has about 700 million active users, and we do about 10 billion logins a day. But for us, the really dramatic growth has come in the business use of our cloud services. And we now have more than 10 million Azure Active Directories that we manage in the cloud uh, uh, all around the world in 28 different data centers. Uh, and we're processing 1.3 billion daily logins. These are all people actively using Azure AD to do some kind of business thing in the cloud. Uh, a lot of what they're doing is they're logging into third-party apps now, too. It, we used to just kind of log people into Office. There are now, last month, there were 82,000 third-party apps. 
that were used with Azure Active Directory as well. So we're really seeing a huge explosion. But the piece I'm the most excited about, and I think is the indicator of the tipping point, is that 90% of the Fortune 500 now have a directory in the cloud with us that they're using for something. They're using it for Azure or Office 365 or Google Apps or Salesforce.com or something like that. Right? So it really is the year where we feel like, OK, the enterprise cloud became a real thing. And you can see digital identity in the cloud playing that key role I talk about as the control plane for the cloud. Uh, a year ago, I suggested, hey, there were six areas that we would love to collaborate with all of you on to see if we can't help drive the, the industry ahead and make, you know, make for a more secure but also more user-friendly experience. These were the six things I laid out, and I thought it would be cool today to kind of just talk about, hey, where are we on these things? Like, how is an industry and as a group collaborating together, how are we doing as a community? Um, the first two I thought I'd talk about are tremendous progress in, a, in two areas we feel really, really positive about. The first is in OAuth 2.0 and OpenID Connect. Just amazing progress. Those have essentially, I think at this point, again, become mainstream technologies. I'm going to show you some cool stuff for those. And then the other one that we really love the progress on is in the FIDO Alliance and the, now the work in the W3C. Uh, but rather than tell you about these, I thought it'd be fun to just show you some demos. Uh, so I'm going to kick off a demo. Now, the, a lot of this is pre-production hardware and pre-production software. So this is me walking the tightrope here. We'll see how it goes. Vittorio warned me, never do this at CIS. Uh, so can we switch over to the Wolf Vision here? OK, so I have two phones here. I'm going to start with the Android phone here. It's a nice little Samsung phone. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and log into this, use my thumb for it. Pretty cool. You can see here I've got three apps installed. I've got my uh, Microsoft Authenticator, I've got my OneDrive app, and I've got PowerPoint. And this is you know, outside of identity teams or identity conferences. This is the most boring demo in the world. But you guys know what's going on here. Microsoft has now OAuth enabled all of our mainstream apps. So all of Office on the desktop, Office on iPhone, Office on Android. And so, hey, look at this. I actually get single sign-on using OAuth. And because I've used my Authenticator app, I don't even have to log in. All right? I just tell it what identity I want to use. Uh, OneDrive's going to come up. It's going to find my uh, files in the cloud for me. And then, just like you would expect, I can go ahead and launch those without having to ever present a username or password. Oh, Vittorio wins, maybe. Oh, no, the file is empty. Nope, there it is. I don't know what that was. OK, so here we go. Here's my file. Vittorio almost won. He might win on the next one. It's much more dangerous. OK, so here we go. So in fact, if you can just, it's hard to see it a little bit in this. But uh, this is actually the slide deck I'm presenting right now. Here in PowerPoint on Android. Why did it work? OAuth 2.0. Really, really cool. OK, so now I have a secret to show you here. You guys are the first big audience to get to see this. This is an HP phone. It's an HP Enterprise phone. It's kind of nice. It's got this really nice edge-to-edge -edge glass on it. Uh, and it's running Windows 10. Uh, so you can see here, here's my Windows 10 uh, login screen. But the cool thing about it is here on the back, you can just sort of see, you see the silver circle here. This is a thumbprint reader. And uh, this is an early implementation of the FIDO compliant standard for a thumbprint reader. So I'm going to show you here. I'm going to go ahead and log in. now. Just watch. I, it's kind of weird. You have to touch on the back, right? That's not what we're all used to. But hey, I'm going to log in just by pushing there. And I'm logged in pretty fast, right? And that's an early, that's Windows Hello, which is, uh, and Windows and Microsoft Passport, which is an early FIDO uh, implementation for this device. Now let's go split screen, guys. Let's go to demo two and the uh, Wolf Vision. But maybe the cooler piece, so this is my other PC over here that you're seeing. Um, I'm going to use my phone now to remotely unlock my PC. And again, this is all, this is a FIDO remote uh, credential I'm using. So here you go. We'll see if it works. I'm now uh, unlocking that PC over there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And again, this, this is kind of showing you the amazing thing we can, the amazing experiences as well as great security we can provide when we do these kinds of open standards work together. I love this one because, one, I never had to enter a username or password, so my risk of phishing is just dramatically reduced, of course. But also the fact that uh, this is such a nice, easy to use experience compared to some of the things we used to do for people. And then I want to show you one more. This might be the highest risk of all of them. So I'm wearing my Microsoft band here. You can kind of see it. And you see this little shield up here? You've probably never seen the shield symbol before. 
That means that my band is connected and authenticated with my other PC. So hey guys, let's switch over to the final demo PC. I think it's number two. All right, so here's my other PC. And since uh, my band is authenticated with it, if this all works, what you're gonna see is I'm gonna come over here and uh, just click the space bar on this PC and it's gonna find my band and log me in. Hey, it worked, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then you can see on my PC here, I even have a gesture to go ahead and lock the PC again. Come on, work. It's hard to do this when you're looking at the Wolf Vision. There, and in just a second, we're gonna see the PC lock as well. Again, this is another early FIDO implementation, and oh, it might lock, we'll see. Uh, and what we're doing here is we've remoted the gesture to the device, and that PC is just not gonna lock. Oh well, you got the idea though. I made it through most of the demo whole. Uh, And while I'm showing you that on a, on a Microsoft band, there's a whole set of devices from all kinds of partners slated, I think we call it the Windows Passport, no, the Windows Hello, of course, because Microsoft, we name things so elegantly. The uh, Windows Hello device framework enables third parties to build uh, devices for this. So you'll see things like uh, NIMI bands and a bunch of other new devices coming soon that'll uh, enable you to do that same kind of thing on a whole variety of different devices fit for different kinds of environments. Uh, so hey, I survived the demo, and the, but more what I wanted to say was amazing progress in these areas. There's still more to do, but I think we really can say, hey, OAuth 2.0 has proven out, and we know that this is, it works, and it in fact is going very mainstream all over the place. We still have a lot more work to do in FIDO, but again, you can see the kinds of amazing user experiences with super high security we can deliver when we work together as an industry to kind of deliver on these standards. Very exciting stuff. Another thing I talked about last year was the need to share intelligence between the community so that we could defend against attackers because the, defackers, the attackers share a lot. And, uh, and we're, at, we're, you know, we're at, a, at a disadvantage if we don't share similarly. Uh, and so being able to share data about ac accounts and what's happening with those is a really important uh, piece of being able to protect people as a community. So with, to talk about that, I wanna welcome Alex Weiner from my team and Adam Dawes from Google up on stage to talk about some of the data sharing work that we did this year together. take the, our responsibility for customer privacy, uh, customer security very seriously. Customers entrust us with their, you know, their, their most precious secrets, and we have an obligation to keep that data safe and private. And so it is with a great deal of caution, I think, that you know, we would approach something like sharing data between systems or between providers, right? We have to be very respectful of that obligation we have to customer privacy. When, um, you know, when you apply that with resources and time and you kind of, where do we focus our efforts, it becomes easy to start thinking about, you know, within our boundaries, we're gonna get very secure. And, you know, both Google and we and other folks have done a great job of building detection systems and countermeasures that defend our system, right? That we can do a reasonably good job of looking at an attack against our system and thinking about how do we detect and, and mitigate that attack. The problem with us working within our boundaries is that the attackers, you know, the criminals, don't respect those boundaries at all. And so they find ways to play in the cracks between the systems. And you know, one very easy example to think about is that if someone is able to compromise a mail provider's account, then they can listen on that account and they can watch and see what other kinds of mail comes in. And maybe you get mail from you know, your friends, but you're also getting mail from your bank and you're getting mail from your social networking providers and you're getting mail from other mail providers. And where we see that uh, you know, weaponized against us is that somebody compromises an account in one system and then uses that to create a domino effect, kind of like the slide is showing, you know, where we have a domino effect of, um, of accounts that can go down, right? So we wanted to think, okay, maybe not just within our boundaries. We needed to start figuring out how to break it down the boundaries. And so we started a conversation. That's right, last year at CIS, we did a demo, uh, Google and Ping and Confirm, talking about how we can all work together to close down accounts that may be in a bad state. 
And now we've taken that early demo that we did in TIS, and we've gotten together Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and over a dozen other large internet players have gotten together within the OpenID Foundation to create the Risk Working Group. And within the Risk Working Group, we're all tr about trying to figure out what signals we can start to send each other to help protect users while mind minding their privacy and making sure that we don't do anything that users are going to get upset about. We've started to share information, and we're seeing some really interesting results. Right. So um, you know, under the auspices of the Risk Working Group, Microsoft and Google began to you know, discuss what's the kind of signal that could be useful to exchange in this case, and, uh, and really trying to figure out, in some ways, you know, to validate the efforts that we're making in terms of the, the OpenID environment. And you know, the idea of sharing data is fairly simple, and the conditions under which we want to share it are fairly simple. But again, you know, privacy constraints, and, and then there's lawyers get involved, and then everything sort of slows down. Um, you, know, you guys, the turtles all the way down. For us, it's been lawyers all the way down. Um, and, um, and so what happens is um, you know, time passes. But recently, we've actually been able to get some early data sharing going. And it's, you know, it, again, getting to this model where we're looking for signals where we see an account is compromised on one side. And there's strong indication that the, the criminals are using that compromise to try to break other accounts. And in this world, we're talking about the accounts between our two systems. That's right. So we've started to share data across the two systems. It's just small level experiments at this point. But the results are really impressive. So we found that for accounts that have been hijacked on the Microsoft side, that those same users, the chances that their account has also been compromised on the Google side, are a thousand times greater than your typical Google account. So by sharing information together, we're able to close the loop and react much more quickly and help protect those users. There's a cool side effect of all this as well, which is as, we, as we've been able to exchange this signal and learn, you know, we, can, we can see where the gaps are, and we're able to strengthen those defenses. So our boundary systems get better too, right? That we're not only able to defend our users and help remediate someone, you know, it gives us a chance to get in front of those domino attacks, but it also allows us to stop the initial attack more effectively because we get the tell that uh, maybe Google can see something we can't or we can see something they can't. And by sharing that information, all the users are getting into a stronger, more defensible position. And it's kind of one of those cases where the, ri the rising tide raises all ships. Uh, we'll be talking more about this uh, for those of you who are interested or want to participate in the conversation at a panel session later on. That's right. At 4.20 today in Salon E, Alex and myself, as well as Andrew Nash from Confirm and Richard Struess from the Department of Homeland Security will be talking about this emerging field of shared signals. So please join us. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So while the lawyers have made that work more challenging than any of us would like, I'm really excited about the progress there. I think it's showing tremendous progress. One of the other areas I talked about last year was how to use machine learning for security purposes. And there's really a whole industry now spun up around this. I think it's called UEBA, uh, User and Entity Behavior Analysis. And this is proving to be very effective as well. So when you start sharing data like this and combining it with all of the data that you can collect, all of a sudden you can do amazing things. So let me give you some examples. We're not the only ones doing this. Lots of people are doing it. But let me give you some examples of how this works. So normally, you know, in the old days when we weren't worried about cybersecurity, uh, a user would just show up and present some kind of proof, and we'd give them back a token and be like, hey, that was great fun. Now we have this problem, though, which is we have this, like, Schrodinger's user. Like, we don't know. Is that a good user or is that a bad user? And a lot of the times that user shows up with a perfectly good proof. Right? In fact, of the 100 or so different context points, data points that we look at for every login, your proof is one of the worst. Right? It turns out that there are lots of people trying to log in with your proof all the time to these systems, and we need a better way to defend you. Uh, so we've gone about doing a bunch of interesting work here. If the slides will advance. So the first thing, you know, if, you're, if you know machine learning, the first thing you do here is if you have a coder develop a classifier for you, and that classifier spits out a bunch of results. Hey, this seems like a real user. This seems like maybe not such a good user. And then you take a whole bunch of data. We collect tons of data. In fact, 10 terabytes a day. It's data that, for instance, in the case, this case we share with Google. It's data that we get from other sources. It's data that we get from all the Microsoft account and Azure AD logins and from Hotmail and things like that. And we then can go ahead and basically analyze our results and see how do we do. 
Was it a true negative and a true positive? We, hey, we got it right. And, or was it a false negative, a false positive? And that goes into our inputs and outputs, which you know, if you're in the industry, you might call that a label. And then a security analyst goes through and scores those things. And then the coder builds a new classifier and the ops person deploys the classifier. And you know, this works. This is a really good system. There's a problem though, there's all these humans in it. Right, so it's slow. It takes like six to eight weeks for this kind of cycle with humans involved. So what we've had to do is go in and automate that whole process of analyzing, updating, and deploying. And this is what you call a learner, right? So the learner now behind our system can take and update the system pretty much any time we need to. Most days we do it every 24 hours. Sometimes we'll have up to three different classifiers running at the same time though to see which one's doing better. Right, so you can just you can basically deploy and update automatically in real time as you need throughout the day uh, to help defeat attacks. So this is really really powerful stuff, and across the industry, I think we're seeing it work. For us, it's been awesome this year. We now protect uh, our account systems from more than 10 million attacks a day, and these are attacks where usually the people have the proof, like I was saying. And then over the past year, we've managed to defeat four billion different attacks using this kind of algorithmic approach to uh, to account security. So a really, a pretty good year in, the, in you know, of collaboration across the community. I would have liked to get more done, but I feel pretty good about these and I feel really good about the machine learning work that we've done. But unfortunately, the battle is far from over. In fact, I think if you look at this guy, it's not just that he's scary, he's irritated, <laughs> right? All we've done is irritate the bad guys at this point and made things a little harder for them. Uh, and the bad guys are getting smarter. Right? Botnets are bigger, they're cheaper, they're more available, they come and go faster. Uh, the bad guys are effectively defeating second factor auth. We know a lot of cases where an oath token is not much better than just a standard proof. Right? Uh, the bad guys are starting to now learn how to feed bad data into the machine learning systems. So the minute we put up a new algorithm, the bad guys are starting to pre-populate -pre data to try to make themselves look like a good user, so you have to keep going back and forth. And then finally, scary enough, we've actually seen some bad guys who are turning machine learning against our machine learning, <laughs> right? Because, yeah, and we knew it was gonna happen. We knew the minute that Azure and Amazon turned on machine learning systems that you could rent for cheap and use for what you wanted, that all of a sudden that would be an attack vector. But the bad guys are smart and they're doing a good job here and they have to, you know, we have to keep going. Let me give you one example. So this is a, a story from us recently. Um, this was a school and uh, as we were bringing on a new set of algorithms in learning mode, we discovered that they had a ton of compromised accounts. Uh, so this is what happened. In, while, we were in learner, while our algorithm was in learning mode, all of a sudden we saw this very large elevation in lockouts from one tenant. Right, so this is not a Azure AD wide attempt. This is one tenant that all of a sudden had a ton of lockouts going on where someone was presenting a wrong credential and then every once in a while presenting the right credential. And it looked, so this is what this tenant's traffic looks like on a normal day. You know, it's pretty steady, it's pretty small, they're all green and successful. That's what it should look like. And on the, and what our learner was showing us was all of a sudden a bunch of new attempts, very, very high volume attempts from IP addresses in a country that was geographically very distant from this school, okay? In fact, we suspect this was probably a state-sponsored attempt to, uh, to hack into this, uh, to this school. Uh, and here's the detail, now this I think is kind of cool. So this is the detail of the attack. You can see on the very far, for you guys left over there, that first spike is the attacker trying out their tools. Make sure it actually works the way they, they think. And then a gap where they go quiet. And then a huge, huge range of attempts. And this is over about a six hour period. So a huge, huge range of attempts to try to get in. And then the blue here is our machine learning system kicking in, updating itself, recognizing that attack, and then going through and defeating, right? So as the blue gets more and more blue, those are more and more times when we are automatically failing that login because we've recognized the IP addresses and we've recognized the attack pattern. And then at the very, very top, you can't even see it, there's a bunch of little greens up there that represent the actual users at the school still being able to log in and get their, uh, get their work done. Um, so this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. The enemies are evolving very quickly and we have to keep evolving with them because winter is still coming, right? Like it hasn't stopped, they're still out there and I don't want to be the guy holding the door. 
Okay? It's not going to be, I want us all working together to figure out how we defeat them before we need to hold the door. So, how do we do this? I think there are six things that as an industry, if we could collaborate on these and make major progress, it would be awesome in terms of keeping us ahead of the attackers. The first is we have to continue the work in FIDO to eliminate passwords, right? Stronger authentication tied to hardware and really great form factors so that the idea of even having a username and password is a thing of the past. While that's still evolving, we need to keep working on phishing protection. The IETF is a great place to do this. Uh, and we really, so, you know, passwords will be around, unfortunately, for a while. We got to figure out how to protect people while those passwords are around. We think the work for shared intelligence and shared intellectual property, particularly in OIDC risk, is super important. We're very excited about the early, uh, the early results there. We would invite more of you to come participate. I think that's, the, uh, that's one of those cases where greater volumes of data will help all of us. There's two new ones I'd like to propose, though, that I think need a lot of work. The first is token binding. So as we make progress on password elimination and making it harder and harder to, uh, to impersonate a user, the next weak link in the chain is being able to take the token and replay it. So we need to quickly get going on, a, on some work that the token is bound to a specific piece of hardware and thus a man in the middle attack against that token isn't useful, right? And FIDO does a great job there, but there's all kinds of access tokens that we need to get to work on to take care of that. So the IETF Unbearable Working Group is a great place to do that. Session revocation, we think, is another big one. Just I, I, after Patrick's talk this morning, I don't even have to say it, right? But we think session revocation is super important uh, and look forward to working with Ping and Google and a whole bunch of other folks in the OIDC to try to make this happen because that's the next thing we got to do, which is, okay, so then an account goes bad. How do we let all the relying parties know that the account went bad and it's time to drop tokens and force a reauthentication? And then finally, we did not make as much progress in the areas of standards for IoT this year as I would hope. Right, it, it's still every new, not every, but it still seems like the majority of devices that become internet aware, become internet aware in ways that are easy to hack and easy to take advantage of. And that gets scarier and scarier every year. So we would invite everybody to come join us in the IETF ACE working group and, and the ISO SC27. We think these are really good ways for the community as a whole to get together. We're big supporters of all these efforts and, uh, and we hope to see you there. Uh, and keep collaborating in the way that we've been doing so far. Uh, because we can only protect the, the wall and our world by working together. It's too big a job for any one of us, and too many users using too many devices in a heterogeneous world of too many services for any one company to really make an impact. Uh, so we love and hope that you'll take us up and, uh, and uh, get actively engaged if you're not already. Uh, so that's kind of my, that's my whole call to action. There's a bunch of new other things you might be interested in over the next uh, rest of the day. Uh, Alex Weinhardt and Adam are giving a talk, uh, like, I, like they were saying. Vittorio, of course, who's our, probably our most famous identity person, is giving a master class uh, tomorrow afternoon. And then on Thursday, Sean is doing an Azure Active Directory talk for Gartner. And then Laura, who, uh, uh, Laura, who now works in Visual Studio, if you didn't know, is uh, going to talk about securing enterprise software. Uh, so that's, that's our story. I really appreciate your time today and uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the community and helping us move all these important efforts forward. Thank you.